No! Come back! Welcome back to the Mental Roulette Grind. This time, we're playing Sage on a Wednesday after the Daily Reset. And this is the first time in quite a while where I had zero guild tests. On the other hand, the highest level duty I got was level 63 to 64. But hey, that also gives us time to have a look at the low level toolkit of Sage, I suppose. Overall, I am very happy with the distribution of duties this time, although I wish we had some more 8 man stuff, or even extremes. Now, for duty 1, we have Tamtara Deepcroft, and apparently it's speedrun time. Throughout the entire dungeon, our tank pretty much full wall to wall pulled with very few exceptions. However, they also made extensive use of Rampart and Low Blow. I didn't see very much use of reprisal or arm's length, which could have made things slightly easier I suppose, but it wouldn't change that much about the result of the duty. Given the rest of the group was Monk, Samurai, Sage, only the tank had an AoE, so these gigapoles primarily were dealt with by the tank's AoE, and me losing one Dosis cast or two more than needed to cast Diagnosis instead isn't going to make that much of a difference here. Sage's toolkit is very impressive in a level 19 dungeon like Tamtara. Dosis, Diagnosis, Cardia, Prognosis, Egiro, and Roll Actions. As we have no instant options, the best I could do when we ran extra far would be to swift cast a Dosis and then just run alongside a mob and slap them around a bit as I do. An interesting detail about the first few bosses in the dungeon, these soul counters, is that they cast this interruptible spell called In Thunder. Interrupting it, or stunning it, is immensely helpful, as the buff it applies to them makes their auto attacks hurt way more than normal. Although, this often doesn't come up in a normal dungeon group, since these bosses usually die before this could even be a problem in the first place. Near the end of the dungeon, there was this point where it seemed like the tank stopped for a moment during the gigapole to test how much damage they were taking before grabbing more. We had no issues though. For duty 2, I was a 7 minute replacement in... Ramu Extreme. With only two tanks. Again. That's an incredible coincidence. While I'm here, I explain how the chance of actually refilling the group is tiny and almost as if the game is trying to prove my point, a healer joins and immediately leaves. For some reason, this then results in one of the tanks pulling, causing a wipe of course. I've said before that it is possible to beat Ramu Extreme synced with two tanks and a healer and nothing else, but all three players need to be well geared, these tanks were not geared well enough, and we might also need some amount of echo bonus, and we would also need to do the fight in perfect sync. As I said, it is possible to do, but I never said, and also, it's easy, Lamau. I usually leave that part out when I say something is done with less than the recommended amount of players, because the difficulty can often be subjective. Now, after we wiped, I looked for my leave button because I wasn't going to sit around repeatedly dying because the tanks are impatient, but before I could, they both left too. For duty 3, we went to Castrum Meridianum, and shocking no one, nothing special happened in this run. It was just a classic MSQ roulette run. So, with that said, I've previously brought this subject up when we've had MSQ roulettes like this, so... What would Viper be like as a Pokemon? I imagine it could be like a fighting poison type with the Parental Bond ability, or at least something similar. This is because Parental Bond makes it so that any attack you do causes an additional, weaker follow-up strike. Then give it attacks like Power Up, Punch and Rapid Spin that increases attack and speed, respectively. And because of the ability, you get boosted twice. And then finish up with a big strong attack like Gunk Shot, leaving a move open to counter something specific, which makes sense for how Vipers hunt down Tural Vidral. The important thing is that Vipers shouldn't take any defensive moves since it doesn't bring much utility. What do you think? And if you imagined a job as a Pokemon, how would you make it? For duty 4, we go to 1000 miles of Totrak, with another tank going full speed mode. It turned out the tank only used Rampart like twice in the dungeon. Once on the first boss and once on the final boss. No other defensives seem to have been used. Again, this was manageable on my end because it is just 1000 Malls of Tatarak. Furthermore, and 
Possibly more importantly, both of our DPS were melees that could keep up with the pack as it was getting pulled and the dungeon is rather long. So often the first pack would be dead or close to by the time the second pack was picked up. Add to this also that Viper has Steel more at this level and Sage has Flemma. And we have some solid AoE DPS exactly for this purpose. There's also the part that Viper just in general is ludicrously busted in low levels, with their single target dual blade combos flat out doing 280 potency every time, before they even get their third steps. And they get a damage and speed buff on top. For duty 5, we go to Aurum Vale. Right at the start, the tank looks like they're going to dash straight through the room, but instead they grab the frog, turn straight left, grab the shrooms and then towards the boss room, which also works. Sometimes you can entirely dodge the frog, but other times it'll yoink the last person as they pass and cause a lot of confusion, so just going for it immediately isn't a bad idea, I guess. However, once we get to the boss room, I get the impression the tank isn't quite sure how to get the plants into the room, so first I try to rescue them behind the wall. No dice. Then I start jumping to indicate for them to go there. In retrospect, I could have tried to use words, but I was afraid stopping casting to talk might drop them dead. The reason why this pull is typically done by pulling the mobs into the boss room is because this is the only really convenient wall in the area, and the plants are ranged. Meaning that for them to come to you, you need to break line of sight to them for a bit for them to come to you. The reason why it might feel like it doesn't work is because breaking line of sight with them goes as follows. The mob waits for their next auto attack. Then they realize they can't swing at you when it is time. Then they start moving, and often tanks give up right around the time they start moving, causing them up to stop and attack from there, starting the process from the top. With that out of the way, on the first boss, I almost thought we could get away with not eating any fruits at all, but in the end, it got a bit scary. On the final boss, though, some of us certainly didn't take any fruits, and didn't need them. For duty 6, we're back in Thousand Moles of Totorak. This time, the tank didn't use a single defensive in the entire duty. However, they also pulled each pack one at a time. A much safer approach, albeit of course also slower. This group also had even more AoE than the previous one, as we had an archer with quick knock and wide volley. By the way, just me or does wide volley look way cooler than shadow bite that it upgrades into? And we also had a monk with Arm of the Destroyer, so it could possibly have gone faster had we pulled bigger. Speaking of which, that actually led me to an interesting thought. A relatively uncommon conversation is how much time it actually saves in a dungeon to go full blast and pull everything compared to doing it in a more careful manner. Obviously, the value in pulling everything is partly dictated by which duty it is and also what level it is and what jobs are present. For example, in a low level dungeon where melee DPS would have zero AoE options, pulling big in a double melee DPS group would only really increase the damage output of the tank, which is still beneficial but less impactful than if the group had been two ranged physical DPS with spammable AoE. With that said, the speedrunning group of duty 4 cleared in 6 minutes and 48 seconds from the duty beginning in earnest to the final hit on the final boss. This slower running group instead took 8 minutes and 18 seconds, a minute and a half longer, or about 19% longer relatively speaking. Is that a big deal? Not really. However, let's say we had pulled big and wiped as a result. The run back would still have been less than a minute and a half, so the time difference is big enough that the risk is probably worth the reward in this case. Next, for duty 7, we went to Somal, with what I could only surmise as either a first-timer or inexperienced machinist. On the first boss, there's an interesting detail about the fight. You can pretty safely completely ignore the hornets, as letting the boss eat the hornets gives it a temporary damage buff that mainly affects the raid-wide attack it uses a bit later, after which the damage buff ends. However, the damage of this raid-wide attack is increased by such a minuscule amount per stack that it hardly matters. Not to mention that if you ignore the Hornets, you can almost certainly kill the boss before it even gets around to this mechanic in the first place. For the second boss, we almost had our machinists sniping themselves by fleeing with the stack marker. And even after seeing us all run to them to help them with the first stack marker, they still didn't seem convinced as they stood exactly on the edge, 
of the second stack marker. For the final boss, I also have a bit of a tip, perhaps more significant for newer players. Make sure to look up from your hotbars every so often and see if your attacks are actually doing damage. If it's a zero or invulnerable, you should investigate why that is, or maybe take a look at what everyone else is attacking. If it says invulnerable, there's almost a 100% chance that what you're doing is accomplishing nothing. If it says zero, there's a chance you're attacking a shield and that shield might be breakable, but you know, investigate. For duty 8, I was a 9 minute replacement in Circus Tower, meaning I missed everything except Zande. There were two pretty funny incidents specifically with this bard in the group, where at first they tried to run away with the stack marker for some reason, and later in the fight they decided to stand outside the ancient Quega, but also survived. Probably not a surprise to a lot of players, but a bit of a surprise to some. Ancient Quega isn't an immediate death if you mess it up, but it does hurt a lot. On the subject of the stack markers, they really do highlight one key thing about multiple stack markers. If they don't have an effect that outright punishes you for overlapping them, you have no reason to not overlap them. X damage split evenly between 8 players is the same as 3x damage split evenly between 24 players. And the more players you add to the stack, the more evenly the split seems to become. As even if you split the stacks up in 3, you might not have 8 in each group, but say 18 or 20 players taking the triple stack is a lot more manageable than 2 or 4 players taking one stack on their own. For duty 9, we went to Halatali Hard. This is a quite interesting dungeon with a bunch of gimmicks. In the first section of the dungeon, there is a pack that would be skippable, but because you're tasked with defeating all the mammoths, you can't skip it. For the first boss, it will use this attack called 1000 ton swing, which is inescapable and hurts quite a bit. But there is this console in the room and if you press it, the mammoth will shortly after apply a huge barrier to every player in the circle. However, the attack is perfectly survivable without this shield, although a different shield might be necessary instead. Maybe. For the second boss, it will cast Demon Eye, and you might be seeing this and thinking, ah, gaze mechanic, but no. Actually, you need to be blind, otherwise it will hit you. Each of the shadowy orbs in the room gives the player that uses it the blind status, although it is removable with a shuna so a healer or a bard could do something really funny and mess with people if they wanted to. If you're blind when the mechanic hits, nothing happens to you. If you are not blind, you instead get stunned for 8 seconds while taking increased damage, which the boss promptly uses to place an avoidable AoE under you that you now cannot avoid. However, even with all that, you can still survive the hit as a DPS. The final boss has this bit with a Lalafell and a demon fighting independently from each other. The Lalafell specifically uses this spell called Standstill, followed by Thal's Fury, and just alternates those two forever. Standstill is dealt with by having a player that isn't stuck press the Thal Scepter to free the two players that are stuck, and then everyone can easily dodge Thal's Fury. There is however also the random chance that the demon Narasimha will do a fire breath attack in the general direction of the stock players that simply has to be survived. For duty 10 we went to Shisui of the Violet Tides. Here's a fun little detail about the second day we pull in the dungeon. We often see that right as the pack dies, a little extra pack of 3 mobs spawn, which is mildly annoying for some. However, the mob that dictates when these extra mobs spawn is the big serpent, so if you focus it down first, you can cleave all the remaining mobs before the boss down together. Also, the three Mutsus are what I define as jerk anglerfish. Why? Did you know that pretty much all enemies that have this kind of model that looks like an anglerfish on land apply some sort of demonic effect? Most commonly they apply a physical vulnerability to the tank and while it is removable with the Shuna, this can sometimes happen at a moment where the healer might not have the GCD real estate to do that. Sometimes these jerk anglerfish also just do something else entirely, like the one in Sastasha that applies a damage buff to itself and any other mobs nearby. Now, for the second boss, we had a moment where the red mage accidentally ran into the aging box while running away from the chasing fire blasts, but hey, 
I saw that coming, so no deaths on my watch. And finally, this crab shortly before the final boss. This might be obvious to some, but not only does it swing pretty hard, but it has a no warning tank buster that could easily take a good fourth of the tank's HP. So be careful letting the tank drop too low in this pull. And finally for duty 11, we have Pharaoh Sirius. And I think this might have been the most careful run of Pharaoh Sirius I've been a part of in a long time. Is that a problem? No. The tank pulled based on what they felt comfortable with, and that's fine. One pack at a time might be necessary if your tank and healer aren't both up to the task, at least in some of these packs. This only does so much though, since most of the bosses in the dungeon almost feel like DPS races, with the first boss seemingly always spiraling out of control right around when the fight ends anyway. For the second boss, we somehow managed to get her down without making her so mad that she started body slamming people. And for this bit before the third boss, we somehow managed to get the valves closed in the weirdest way possible while standing right in the firing range of it. On the final boss, it is worth knowing that she is stunnable, as if interrupting isn't an option for whatever reason. This can stop her lunatic voice. Does that matter? Not really. Turns out the healing reduction on that effect is rather tame. But you can stun her. Right at the end, just before she became untargetable, the Viper decided to use Limit Break and apparently caught her on the way up. I was so confident nothing would happen, but hey, that saved us a bit of time. A very leveling duty centric set this time around, but I guess that I should have seen that one coming with how little of these kinds of duties I've had so far in these men's roulettes in Dawn Trail. This is still way better than Guild Hests. It would be weird, but I would gladly take 10 Sastasha runs in a row over 30 under the armors, even if it is a much less lucrative reward for me. Now, that is all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to support me and my channel more directly, you can become a member like these wonderful people here. You can also alternatively support me through Ko-Fi, link in the description. You can also support the channel by letting the YouTube algorithm know by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, sharing, and hitting the bell to get notified when next I post a video. Fun fact, before the release of Dawn Trail, there was a period where Sages of Creation Discrasia's tooltip was revealed where it didn't state that it was mutually exclusive with Yiv Creation Doses, which meant that there had been a possibility that you would have benefited from maintaining both, even on a single target, since Yiv Creation Discrasia still does slightly more damage to a single target than a regular Doses. By the official release, this was no longer the case, although, interestingly, an alternative way to make sure players didn't do this would simply had been to make sure the dart from Yiv Creation Discrasia was less potency combined than doses on a single target.